my name is Raja Guhachakrta. I'm a professor of astronomy and astrophysics at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And for the last four decades, I have been doing research on the formation and temporal evolution of galaxies and their resolved stellar populations. Uh, this research has engaged young people, i.e. aspiring scientists. Now, if you go to the first slide, please. My, um, in addition to engaging young people, my, a group of us at UC Santa Cruz, my UCSC colleagues and I, have been running the crest umbrella of experiential learning programs. CREST stands for Creating Equity in STEAM, and STEAM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Mathematics. CREST engages young people from all walks of life in critical thinking in a variety of subject areas, but always in the context of open-ended research under the mentorship of world experts. The goal of CREST is to increase the participation of students from historically underrepresented groups. Today, the world faces several major problems. War, inadequate health care, a shortage of resources, just to name a few. We find ourselves at a desperately challenging time and place in history. The gravest of these problems have a disproportionately large negative impact on those who are at the margins of our society. And yet, those among us who are most deeply affected by these problems tend not to have a seat at the table when it comes to finding solutions to these problems. It is against this backdrop of inequities and lack of inclusion that I want to tell you a story of hope about the deep connection between excellence and DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. It is a story about the Indian cricket team that went on to win the World Cup in 1983. You see, I grew up a huge fan of Indian cricket, but for the longest time, that meant being a fan in a losing cause. In the 1960s and 70s, the Indian cricket team would pretty much lose every single match it played. A running joke was the only thing they could ever catch was a cold. They couldn't catch the ball. Um, so this went on, and they went into the 1983 World Cup tournament having played two previous World Cup tournaments in 1975 and 1980. 1975 and 1979, the tournament was played every four years. But they had a cumulative record of a solitary win and five losses after two tournaments. That solitary win had come against a team from East Africa who were newcomers to cricket. So going into that opening match of the third World Cup tournament um, in England in the summer of 1983, India were rated 60 to 1 outsiders against the mighty West Indies. The West Indies had won each of the previous two World Cups. So you could see the, um, the David and Goliath um, situation here. But guess what? India beat the West Indies in that opening match. Even the most ardent fans, myself included, thought that this was just a flash in the pan. But little did we know that the pan had well and truly caught on fire. India went on to win a few more group stage matches, beating some big name teams along the way. They made it to the semi-finals where they met England, the runners up from the previous World Cup, and they beat England. And in the dramatic finals, India beat the mighty West Indies for a second time in the tournament and lifted the World Cup trophy. Their Cinderella story captured the attention of the cricketing world. 
Of course, I also have memories of the losing Indian cricket team from the 1960s and 70s. After each match, you know, the news reporters would come up to the captain or the best player in the losing cause, and they would interview them. And it, you know, didn't strike me as odd that these interviews were conducted in English. And that most players on the Indian cricket team spoke the Queen's English. Now, what was true in India back then, and what is true to, still true to some extent today, is that a person's English proficiency and accent are, a fairly, ac are fairly accurate markers of their socioeconomic status. So in other words, the demographics of the Indian cricket team back then weren't exactly representative of the country's population. In the 19, late 1970s, though, they started to change. A prodigiously talented young player named Kapil Dev from rural Haryana, a northern Indian state, burst onto the national stage. It didn't matter that his spoken English didn't sound like that of his teammates. It didn't matter. He nevertheless rose to become the captain of the Indian cricket team for the 1983 World Cup. And when his team had all but collapsed in a group stage match against Zimbabwe, which was effectively an elimination match for the Indian team, Kapil put in a batting performance for the ages to rescue his team. In the World Cup final, in the latter stages of that final, the famous final now, the Indian cricket team once again looked down for the count against the mighty West Indies. When Kapil Dev raced down the field, chasing after an aerial shot, and took an acrobatic over-the-shoulder catch to dismiss the best player in the opposition's team, so Vivian Richards. And if you could go to the next slide, please. Like Roger Federer did many a time on the tennis court, Kapil made that impossible task look easy in that moment. Many have said that Kapil Dev's spectacular catch changed the course of that 1983 World Cup final. Some have even said that that catch changed the trajectory of Indian cricket forever. If you could go to the next slide, please. We have a video clip of that catch, courtesy of a fellow cricket fan in India who posted it on YouTube. I'm going to step out of the way so you can see it. to show that famous catch from two different camera angles. In the first angle, the camera operator actually tracks the wrong player. <laughs> track the player on the left, Yashpal Sharma, who's running sideways rather than backwards, assuming he'll go for the catch, right? Because Yashpal has a better angle on the ball. But Kapil calls off that player, even though he has a more difficult angle, just self-confidence, runs and executes, takes the catch, as you can see in the second camera angle. Now, another hero for India in that 1983 World Cup tournament was their vice captain, Mohinder Amarnath, who goes by the nickname Jimmy. He is seen near the end of that video clip where he takes the final West Indian wicket to seal India's World Cup victory. Jimmy Amarnath's standout performance earned him Man of the Match awards in both the semi-finals and the finals. Jimmy's father, Lala Amarnath, was the first captain of the post-colonial Indian cricket team, and he had broken a glass ceiling of sorts years earlier. Recently, I had the privilege of having a conversation with Jimmy Amarnath about the 1983 World Cup after he kindly sent me a greeting. So if we could click forward a couple of slides, you'll get to another greeting. You know, uh, uh, please go ahead one more. Uh, one more, please. And if you could click one more time. Here, yeah, Mr. Thakur. No, this one. Back, <laughs> sorry. Back, please. <laughs> one more? Okay. 
Forward. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yes. You just click, it should do it. Dear Mr. Takurta, happy birthday, have loads of fun, and have a great day. Very sweet of him. Um, I won't tell you the whole story of how how we got connected, but my conversation with Jimmy Amarnath tell, inspired me to tell you the story that I'm telling you today. Now, the Indian cricket team's win-loss record over the course of the last four decades that I've been a researcher and since the 1983 World Cup, their win-loss rec record in the last four decades bears very little resemblance to their record from the 1960s and 70s. In these 40 years, there have been 10 World Cup tournaments that take place every four years. They've taken place since 1983. India have won one other time, that was in 2011. They've been runners-up twice, since they got to the finals, and they've been semi-finalists four times. That is, they ended their campaign uh, at the semi-finalist record four times. Their record in these World Cup tournaments is second only to Australia's. Cricket is now played in three different formats, and India has been and is at or near the top in all three of these formats. During this same time frame, there were many rags to riches stories in Indian cricket. M.S. Dhoni, the charismatic captain fantastic of the 2011 World Cup winning Indian cricket team, had started out working as a traveling ticket examiner for the Indian railways in the eastern state of Jharkhand, then Bihar, before he made it big as a cricketer. The talented Pathan brothers, Irfan and Yusuf, grew up in a low-income family in the western state of Gujarat. The Indian team currently has a fearsome trio of bowlers. Jaspreet Bunra was born to a Punjabi Sikh family that was living in Gujarat. Mohammad Shami grew up in a village in Uttar Pradesh in northern India. Mohammad Siraj grew up in a low-income family in Hyderabad in the southern Indian state of Telangana. The list goes on. Today, it is common for interviews with Indian cricketers to be conducted in Hindi not in English. This dramatic increase in diversity in Indian cricket has coincided with the team's meteoric rise in world cricket. It feels natural to me, therefore, to connect the dots and to hypothesize that the team's success over the last four decades has something to do with the fact that Indian cricket is tapping into a broad talent pool. And this is something that was not happening in the 60s and 70s. I'm sure there's a combination of entangled factors at play, the large influx of money into the sport being one of those factors. But Brazilian soccer is another great example of a sport in which the majority of superstars have had modest beginnings in the favelas, in the large urban slums of Rio de Janeiro, Rio de Janeiro, and Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo. In the United States, the National Basketball Association is a strong example of a group of athletes that is diverse on a national and international scale and plays the sport at the very highest level. Uh, while my three examples today, Indian cricket, Brazilian soccer, and the NBA, are all sports franchises, I'm reminded that excellence in sports is as much about mental toughness, temperament, and self-belief as it is about physical prowess. Resilience is a big reason for the success of every top athlete, just as it is for every successful scientist. You could go to the next slide, please. A couple more slides. Yeah, Mr. Chakurta. Sorry. And this one. Thank you. As an astrophysicist, I bask in the glow of spectacular discoveries about the universe. Here are a couple of images from the James Webb Telescope. The one on the lower left and the one in the upper right are images from the famous James Webb Telescope. In the lower right is the famous black hole silhouette taken with an Earth-based event horizon telescope. The background image you were looking at in some of my previous slides are the Hubble telescope's view of our neighboring galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy. Next slide, please. Then there's LIGO, Laser Interferometric Gravitational Observatory. This telescope recently made the first detection of gravitational waves, a remarkably precise measurement made a hundred years after Albert Einstein predicted the existence of such waves. As we celebrate these discoveries, as astronomers, astrophysicists, I'm left wondering what greater discoveries 
the future will bring. So next slide, please. In closing, I would love for all of us together to imagine a future in which there's been a large-scale positive shift in DEI, in diversity, equity, inclusion, across all sections of society, including my field of astrophysics, STEAM more generally, all of academia. And let's imagine that this massive DEI phase transition results in humanity scaling unprecedented heights of excellence and success, making great strides in finding solutions to the great problems that the world faces today. Thank you.